Well, good evening. I'm David Rubin, the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art here at SAMA. And welcome uh, to another one of our artist conversations. And a very special welcome to our guest tonight, John Hernandez. How do you do? <laughs> Before we begin, I have a few announcements. Um, first, of course, please turn off your cell phones if you've not done so already. We are videotaping this evening. And um, if we go on for an hour, um, our education director, Katie, will walk up to the front and let us know. So we'll pause for a moment to change the tape. Uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end, um, at which point, point a microphone will be passed around so that it can be recorded for the video. Uh, tonight's program is sponsored by the Mary Cargill Lecture Series Endowment. We're so grateful to the Cargill family for making that happen. And uh, we also want to recognize the efforts of Joe Diaz, who is here tonight, who was the, yes, who was the inspiration for this exhibition, and of course the primary lender to the exhibition. We're also um, thankful to the, um, uh, to the other lenders to uh, Zoe's Room, which include Arturo Almeida and Daniel Guerrero, Paul and Claire Burney, Celia Alvarez Munoz, and Charles D. Mitchell. Uh, could not happen without these uh, collectors generously loaning their work to the museum. We are also especially grateful to the sponsors of the exhibition, the Helen and Everett Jones Exhibition Endowment in the City of, of San Antonio Office of Cultural Affairs, as well as Sarah E. Hart and John S. Gutzler, who helped make the exhibition possible. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that we are working on a catalog for the exhibition, and if you're interested in being notified when it is ready, uh, please notify uh, the museum store. You can leave your email address with us, and we'll send you an email as soon as it is available. Um, also, if you haven't seen it yet, our museum store now carries these wonderful uh, note cards with John Hernandez's work on them. They make great birthday cards and whatnot. So if you can't afford to own John's art firsthand, you can certainly own these great reproductions of them. And then one last announcement. Tomorrow, <coughs> From 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, there is a uh, shopping event going on that will benefit SAMA Contemporaries, a contemporary art group at this museum. And of course, any funds will help programs like this continue in the future. Um, it is a sale of jewelry and accessories by Henry Bendel of New York. And it's being hosted by Kathy Nicholson, Kathleen LaFleur, and Annabelle Watson. The address is 205 Park Hill Drive. So if you're looking for great jewelry or accessories from New York City, uh, any sales will benefit, 10% uh, of the sales, I should say, will benefit Sabba Contemporaries. And we're grateful to the hosts for putting that on. Now it's time to focus on John Hernandez. Yeah. Welcome, John. So John, you were born in San Antonio and raised here, born in 1952. So you're, you're a true baby boomer. That's right, uh, yes. Um, let's um, see what you looked like back then. You want to tell us a little bit about these photos? Who's the woman in the picture? Well, that's my grandmother who owned the hotel that's right behind the Alameda Theater. Mm -hmm. And so that's the rooftop. And so I spent a lot of time downtown in the 50s and 60s. Um, did you go to the Alameda Theater a lot? Oh, yeah, I went to Alameda, Nacional, Texas, Empire, Joy. We weren't supposed to go to the Joy Theater. Why is that? Well, it has a little sleazy. Oh, OK. But they had horror movies there. You were a big fan of horror movies, yes, right? Yes, I went to Majestic, Aztec, Texas. Every theater that was in town and underground bookstores they had bookstores that used to go below the street levels. And you go to all the bookstores and buy all the little horror magazines, sci-fi magazines. And I would go there as a kid after I'd do my chores there at the hotel. Did you, so did you um, collect them? Uh, like when you finished them, did you keep them? Did you start no. collecting yet? No, I didn't really buy any of them. I would just look at them. Oh, OK. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was too young. I couldn't buy them. What so. were some of the other, because I know uh, some of the childhood influences were very important, or to this day, very important to you as an artist. What were some of the other um, influences? Uh, well, you know, like, well, downtown specifically was the theaters and the carnival, the, the carnival that would come downtown when it was mostly all downtown. I could watch them build it from the hotel second story or on the roof, could watch them build it. So I could even go there while they're building it. And on top of that, I would just, and then when I was at home, not at the hotel, then I would just play with all the things, you know. My parents would buy me, which basically models. 
That's right. You were very fond of model building. Uh huh. You? Yeah, I did a lot of models. You know, model of anything. Homes, boats, cars, monsters. Okay. Anatomy figures. Tell us about this photo here. Or you were playing pirate. Oh, that's <laughs> when we went to Mexico and Acapulco. That was one of the first vacations we ever went outside of Texas, and I had that photo there. So I kind of liked it because it's kind of like a little Mexican Disney thing. <laughs> now I know you were building models. Were you actually doing an artwork at all as a child? Like in grammar school, did did you? Uh, yeah, they had they had me do the the map, weather man and the weather map at the school. But they always had beetle haircuts. Who had beetles ha haircuts? The weather man. Oh, had the weather man had beetles haircuts. Okay. Um, so they had me do the weather stuff. Did school. you did you think of yourself as an artist when you were a kid? No, not really. Not until maybe high school. I started did you, wanting did you to see, be an artist. By the way, did you see any art when you were a kid? Were you familiar with art at all? Did the you only art I ever saw was probably in the theaters, the Alameda mural, or the earliest was at the Witty, maybe 67, when they had the pop shows, and they had the kinetic art and inflatable <laughs> art at the Witty Museum. And that's the first really real art show I saw. Mm -hmm. Next Did it make you want to make art? Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. really liked it, yeah. Uh -huh. And then, um, now, as far as your education, um, you started out uh, as an art major, did you not, at San Antonio College? Yes, yeah, San Antonio College. I specifically went to go study arts. Yeah. And what happened? Uh, you, you stayed there for two years, but then you moved on. Yeah, I went there two years, and then I had, you know, and then I went to Our Lady of the Lake, studied art there, and then I was changed my mind and wanted to go into social work. But then I did horrible grades on that, so I went back to art. And I got my <laughs> liberal arts degree there uh -huh. at the lake, and then went to Denton. Uh, Denton, Denton in, Texas. in Texas. OK, and what was that like having you? Because you lived in San Antonio uh -huh. your whole life. Right. How did you feel what, about Dallas? Was it like the big city? Yeah, or? it was like the big city. I didn't, you know, when I first woke up, the first night I stayed in an apartment there, downtown Dallas on the east side, which was kind of rough. I didn't know where I was. It was like, because I had a week to move to go to school, and I just went straight from home, never lived away from home, went straight to, Den to Dallas, never lived in Dallas, and ended up in a little apartment in East Dallas. Mm -hmm. That was kind of strange. And yeah. you had some, uh, some teachers and professors there who I think ended up being very influential on you, did you not? Yeah, they had Vernon Fisher was one of my teachers and, uh, there, and at uh, SAC it was, uh, what was his name? Uh, Mel Casas, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. and Luis Jimenez. But in Dallas, it was Bernie Fisher and then some other artists. And a lot of the Oak Cliff School there in, De in Oak Cliff influenced me. They were there. There was a George Green. Mm -hmm. He was sort of like a Chicago Harry Who type of artist, but Texas style. You're kind of abstract. Of, he yeah, abstract, weird abstract patterns, work. tiles. And, right. And uh, that guy. Uh, What's his name? That did the giant lizards made out of metal, giant cowboy hats. Bob Wade. Bob Wade, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. Bob Wade. Mm -hmm. So all those are. That's what really attracted me to Dallas was that little school of artists. Because it you, was just you so knew, weird. You knew that they were there before you went. So you went oh, to study yeah, with them specifically. Oh yeah, I knew about them in San Antonio. Yeah. What attracted you about their work? Well, it was just so weird. They just it was almost kind of like they were like the Chicago Harry Who, but they were Texas style. Uh, Texas style Harry Who. Yeah, it was like a Texas style Harry Who. It was just odd. Yeah. Okay, now, um, how old are you in, the, in these photos, would you say? Late 20s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. And this is in Dallas. That, yeah, it's in that Oak Cliff, right across the Trinity River in a small apartment. Mm -hmm. What uh -huh. are you working on there? Uh, that was a relief that went to the Arco Tower. I forget the name of that relief. Oh, Tired or something Tired. And, uh, mm -hmm. So this is after you got your, your the, uh, MFA? Yeah, about mm -hmm. a year after, two mm -hmm. years after. Okay. Well, let's start looking at your work. Oh, before we look at your work, yes, that's what I wanted to also share this with our audience. What are we looking at here? So that's part of my toy collection. But really, I started my toy collection in Dallas, but this is the This line. is in your house this here is in my San house Antonio. Now. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, when shelves and shelves You started these. collecting toys in Dallas. What made you want to collect the toys in the first place? I really don't know. Well, there was always little thrift stores in Oak Cliff, so I would just go buy these things. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't have any reason, just, I just bought them, you know, like collecting them. Mm -hmm. And how many do you think you own currently, would you guess? 
I don't know, over a thousand, I get a thousand. And, you know, that box was just a little part that's in that right. plexiglass box. Right, box. Yeah, these are sort of my, my museum. I don't, I, don't, I don't move those in the box. In the and, um, and you don't actually have them all on display at your house no, either? Uh, no, they're in boxes and closets. Mm -hmm. And where do, you, where do you find them still? Now, when I first moved to San Antonio, the majority of all of these came from San Antonio thrift stores. I spent over Do you a couple recommend of years. if anybody in our audience wants to go looking for vintage toys, where would they go? Well, they don't, can't find them in the thrift stores anymore. When I first moved here, it's when I went and found bags and bags of them. Is it all, all them. eBay now? Do you shop yeah, on eBay? No, I don't even go to eBay anymore, but that's a place to go. Mm -hmm. But, huh? <laughs> what? The, someone asked where you live. I live there on, by St. Mary's University mm -hmm. on the west side of town. Mm -hmm. You live in the house you grew up in, don't yes, you? Yes, uh huh. Yeah, well, yeah well, one of the houses I grew up in. I grew up as a teenager in that house. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you also, don't you also have a collection of psychedelic posters? Yeah, I have a big, I have a, 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 an a original psychedelic posters from the 60s. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. well, who are some of the groups that, you, that you're fondest of from that period? Uh, you know, like everybody's, I guess, in the 60s, Doors, Beatles, Jefferson Airplane, Big Brother Holding Company. And of course, 13. as we'll see, all of that has had a huge influence on your art. Oh, yeah, that, I collected those when I was in uh, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I had them in my original room in that house. Mm -hmm. So I rebought the originals when I moved back here. Because mm -hmm. those aren't the ones I had as a kid. Right. Yeah, I had big posters, lots of posters okay. as a kid that now, I bought downtown. This is a very early work of yours. Grasshopper. From the early 1980s, a grasshopper. So um, tell us about the idea for the work and the process of making it? Mm. Well, I, I started out as a painter and I didn't like changing. When I had made mistakes on a painting, I didn't really like erasing too much on that painting. It was too much. So I ended up doing a collage. I always done little collages. Mm -hmm. So I just started, instead of painting on canvas, I would just paint on an illustration board and then, or cut out the little shapes. And they evolved into a sort of these kind of 3D collage. So if I made mistakes, I could just do away with that shape and recut it and move it around. I didn't have to erase on the canvas. And I got the ideas also from 3D post, uh, 3D billboards or 3D models you would find in theater lobbies, you know, that advertise movies. And that's where I got some of my inspiration from to make 3D and also 3D pop-up mm -hmm. books. Why a grasshopper? I don't know. You don't remember? I, well, I just, it was just an interesting shape. I just like the idea of this giant grasshopper leg mm -hmm. that I got from a biology book. And the, I really can't tell you why it got so diverse and all those images. It just sort of, just sort of evolved that way. Uh, and what's the scale of this piece? Well, I would say it's about four feet across, maybe okay, two. Because so it's a pretty feet. large grasshopper. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah, it's a big grasshopper. Leg. Okay. Now, these are also from the early 80s. Uh -huh. um, we have uh, Two Fish and Kingpin. Two Fish and Kingpin, yes. Uh, two yeah. Fish is the one with the little kiddies pool. Well, you know, really, one of the, one of the inspirations also was trash I would find in, in, on the street. You would find piles of trash piled on top of each other. So in a way, these are piles of things that they're a little more refined because I selected the images. So did you just like? Trash. Would you if you were driving around and you saw a pile of trash? Yeah, would, would you just like get out of your car and go? Well, rummage I through would. It? You could just walk down the street and see it. No, like in San Antonio, you see it here. You know, my neighborhood, you see piles of trash, and I would stop and look at them. Mm -hmm. But would you take stuff home with you? Yeah, mm -hmm. once in a while, some of these real <laughs> early ones I don't show here. I have actual pieces in the reliefs, but then I did away with that and just made them more. Mm -hmm. An illusion. Of Let me ask stuff. you though, um, to get to these images, do you, do you start by drawing? Where do the images originate in your process? I like get like the bowling ball and the pin, for example. Where did that, did you first make some drawings of that? Yeah, I think that's just all drawing. I, I didn't really select anything from the book and that piece outside of maybe the little toys that are in the bowling pin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think at this period I mostly drew what I thought about it wasn't coming from specific magazines or books or anything. You weren't, the appropri you weren't the appropriating yet. Huh? You weren't appropriating yet. Not, no, not that much. Maybe some of the toys in there. Now, the grasshopper leg came from a biology book, mm -hmm. a little leg. Mm -hmm. But these, I don't recall that I copied anything. Maybe the little pills from a little advertising or something in the bowling pin. But most of that was just... <laughs> I might have seen the Sputnik somewhere. I might have copied that. And the two fish. It's a little black thing that's to the left of the 
mm -hmm. yellow ring. That's a mm -hmm. kiddie pool. Mm -hmm. And already we're seeing a kind of complexity in the way you're organizing the forms. And I think <coughs> excuse me, part of it goes back to your experience of building models, the, <laughs> the way you would take these different parts and piece them together. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, like models, models, mm -hmm. model type things. OK, now for those of you who haven't been through Zoe's room yet, I'm assuming most of you have, Zoe's room, this new installation, is sort of a cumulative retrospective. There are earlier works that have that you showed made earlier on and showed earlier on, but now you've put them in a new environment, which is collectively Zoe's room. So as we go through this presentation, you'll be seeing some things from Zoe's room and some things that aren't. We wanted to try to do a roughly chronological um, presentation of how John's work has evolved over the years. Um, in this example, we have a kind of a character that you first developed in 1984, and then re the character resurfaced again in the early 2000s, and that's Bird Brain. How yeah, Bird Brain. How, tell us about the idea. How, you remember how the idea, because you, you, it's become kind of architectural. This is a sculptural work that actually is dependent upon architecture for its existence. Yeah, well, I did this Bird Brain series, like he says, 84, and I, when I went to New York, I saw this one piece this artist did. It was a uh, bomb. He did these bombs that would hit the walls. So when I came back, I liked that idea of things. And also, it has like a little art thing because it's working with the corner. Mm -hmm. And so I like that. But then instead of a bomb, I said, well, I'll do bird, uh, 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 a little, supposed to be a little vulture, mm -hmm. a little vulture. And so I just, I don't know, it just came to me where I would just do a bird that bumped its head into the wall and I turned a little beak and I thought that was well, kind of Well, it funny. makes me think of some of the Looney Tunes, you know, that influenced you with the animals uh, always, like, the an yeah. like, like we have, uh, what's this, Wile E. Coyotes always exploding uh -huh. and several of the others. Tell us a little bit about um, how those cartoons influenced you because I know we've talked about that before. Well, I always looked at the, those um, Warner Brother cartoons like the Coyote, Merry Melodies. Merry Melody cartoons. Mm -hmm. and, and this really came from a little vulture that's a little, a cartoon that it's a baby vulture, mama vulture. Maybe you all remember when uh, he had to get flying out of the nest. The mother would throw him out in the nest. He had sort of like this kind of weird European accent. And I always liked that beak, the way it looks. So it was kind of, it's, and Popeye has one of the little vultures in it too. So this all came from the, that, looking at those little buzzards. They're not vultures, they're little buzzards. <laughs> They're always kind of like these dumb, little dumb bugs. Okay, now here's where you really come into your mature identity, you know, where this, you know this is John Hernandez now because nobody had made a sculpture that looked anything like this. And we're looking at two sides here of a sculpture called The Living Eye uh -huh. from the mid 80s. And it's of course in Zoe's room in its newest incarnation. It seems to reappear every so often in, in your installations. Um, Again, I think it, with this one, it's going to be helpful for you to tell us a little bit about, about all the parts, because there's so much going on in there. OK. Uh, well, OK, now this, I would say the majority of these were appropriated from images from comic books or magazines. And there was nothing that I really, or actual toys. So the first image is a comic book from the 60s was that surfer. That's the little guy with the surfboard. And then they had the octopus. And that was an actual toy that you could throw it against the wall and it would stick and it would crawl down. So that was the octopus toy. And then I had uh, uh, the astronaut helmet with the skull in it. That's from a 50s horror movie poster. And then the drum I just made up. And then they have all the little cartoon characters from coloring books. And so it's basically a uh, surfer riding an uh, octopus. And he's carrying like per he's supposed to be carrying like coins or pearls. He's holding on to his little surfboard. And then on the back, I did a collage of a, of an image of a beetle from a National Geographic, but I collaged it with another little it's a little box with a little kitten cards. And I that's painted on a pegboard. And I always liked that because it was like a, like impressionism or something, pointillism, but it had those little dots drilled into the walls and to the pegboard. But it was like a rhinoceros beetle. So it's like nature, and then you have, I always like to do nature images with these kind of weird characters and sci-fi. Why'd you call it Living Eye? Uh, that was uh, from an old psychedelic uh, 
band from the 60s from Austin called Living Eye. And so I don't know where I got that title from, how I found it, but I liked that idea and I just, and it had an eyeball in it, so I called it The Living Eye. Now, um, in some of the material that's been written about your work in the past, there's been some commentary about uh, the, this particular piece having to do with self-absorption. How do you feel about that? I know some of the critics who have written about you have commented on that. About the big ego thing. I mean, yeah, you know, I think 80s. it's like a little, yeah, well, it's just a kind of self-involved little surfer is kind of writing this. I tend to want to do squids and octopuses a lot because they have all these arms and they can, you know, I just like that form, but uh, that can really symbolize a lot of things. And uh, But uh, it was during the mid-80s, you know, when all that was going on with the me generation. Now, this is the most complex one we've seen so far. So let's go back to process a little bit. Did this one also start with some drawings? How did it start? It started out a uh, real simple collage, a drawing of the octopus and the little surfer. That was it. Mm -hmm. And then I just cut it out and it sort of evolved on it, on its own. And then I built the drum that's on wheels. That's a little drum bass. I mm -hmm. like the idea of him being on a drum, like a musical drum. Mm -hmm. It has that's on wheels. And uh, it's like a big toy music music box. I was going to say, yeah, and I know you've done a lot of, uh, you've actually used music boxes yeah, in I your used, work. Oh, yeah, I used to buy old new music boxes and make them into little sculptures and uh, they would have music and everything. So this is sort of like, this was one of the, kind of like a big music box without the music. Exactly. Okay, now also you started doing, uh, you, had, you had done wall pieces like this before with dis disparate parts sort of spread across the wall, but now it's really gotten colorful. It's, uh -huh. uh, you know, you could say it's gotten psychedelic at this point. Yeah, well, you know, when you have a person like, uh, when you, you know, have a teacher like Vernon Fisher and his paintings are all black and white, so I just wanted to go to the extreme. So you rebelled in a yeah, way. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to go to the extreme. I said, I'll just do all this wild color. 